Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share the experiences that we have with the California ISO in the United States. Uh, thank you to Kakoli in particular for all the logistics to make it work my trip and also to the USA. Uh, the information I want to share with you has to do more specifically with one of the ISOs that we have in the United States that belongs to the California ISO. You are going to find that among the different ISOs, there are many common factors, but each uh, operator is slightly different given the conditions that they are located with. Uh, I try to focus this uh, discussion mostly on the operation side, given the fact that there may be many engineers here. And it combines not just the perspective of operations, but also the combination with the markets. Uh, back in 2000, we implemented what we have as a market. That happened to be problematic, and then eventually we converted to the nodal market. The philosophy that we have in California is that we run the system, we operate the system through the market. We believe in the market, and as such, is the mechanism that we use to really operate the, the system. Uh, to give you a perspective, we have different control systems in the United States. One of them is obviously the California system operator. Uh, typically, our area and footprint has been the geographical area of California. More recently, we have expanded to cover adjacent states in the United States, and we still have a, what we call a balancing market. That is no more than balancing supply and demand across this multi-balancing area system. We are one of the balancing areas in the west of the United States, and this is very interesting because, unlike many other places, uh, even though we have a federal structure, we are regulated by the Federal Commission, many of the policies, many of the energy policies are actually driven by the state. Uh, as you may know, California is very aggressive and liberal in terms of environment, and many of those policies that eventually impact the transmission system, the electric system, has to do with these environmental policies. Uh, we obviously have a market that is a very typical structure for the nodal market, and we have more than one function to perform. Obviously, the first one is reliability. We have to keep the lights on, and we have to operate and control the system. As I indicated before, we do this through the market. We have a fully nodal market that goes from the day ahead to the real-time market, and we also deal with transmission planning and generation planning. And this is what we call the plant grid expansion. Therefore, the two key functions that have to do with the renewable integration is mostly in the operation side and also on the market side. Uh, just to give you a context of the size of our system, typically our peak load is in the range of 50,000 megawatts. We peak in the summer. Our lowest load is in the range of 30,000 megawatts in the, in the winter to transition of the spring. And since 2014, we have expanded the operation of the real-time market. Not only California, but also the adjacent balancing areas to California are subject to this balancing market that is matching supply and demand on a five-minute basis. And one of the key goals for this uh, expansion has to do with diversity. Given the fact that we have so much renewable penetration, obviously having diverse sources and conditions in the system allows you to maximize that penetration of renewable resources. Uh, this is not unique to California. Even though California has a very aggressive set of environmental goals, there is just this natural transformation of the electric industry. First, we have renewable resources, such as wind and solar, that are the gross amount of renewable resources in the system. But together with that, one of the byproducts of having all these environmental goals has to do with other sources of renewable generation, and that is what we call behind the mirror. That could be as simple as rooftop solar generation that, at the end of the day, has a big impact on the system because it's, given the magnitude of that penetration, it really plays a key role on the operation of the system. Just to give you a context of the size of the renewable penetration that we have in California, if we are talking about a 50,000 megawatt system, you have about 11,000 megawatts of solar, about 6,000 megawatts of wind, 
And what we call behind the mirror, that is solar generation behind the mirror, is about 7,000 megawatts. All that together sizes amount about a half of the system. Uh, there, there is a very interesting metric that we have. If you measure at any point on time what has been the demand supported by renewable pen, uh, resources, at any given point on time, we have reached basically 70% of the load. At any point in four second time frame, you are saying that about 70% of that demand has to be met with renewable resources. From the operations point of view, that is quite a challenge because of all the intricacies that we have for the operation of the system. What is the main challenge that we have from the operation point of view? Obviously, we have this transformation of the generation mix. We are moving away from the typical conventional generation towards a more clean, environmental friendly generation. When you compare side to side the conventional generation versus the renewable generation, you have these inherent differences that somehow we have to accommodate now in the operation of the system. The first and most challenging one is predictability. Obviously, when you have conventional generation, a coal plant, a, a gas plant, you know exactly what is the availability of the unit, how much generation it can provide. You have all the certainty how to operate that uh, unit. On the other end, when you have renewable resources, that certainty goes away. Inherently, the renewable resources are going to have this high degree of uncertainty and unpredictability. Even though you can have very robust techniques to do forecasting, still, the weather plays its role. The nature of the weather is going to give you that inherent uncertainty by having these renewable resources. Uh, the other piece is dispatchability. Conventional generation is fully controllable. You can send a signal to where to operate in every five minutes, and you know that they can easily reach that target point. When you move that into the renewable resources, that is less certain. Now, with the old technology that we have for renewable resources, uh, there was this belief that you have just to take as given the generation from these resources. With current technology, that is no longer the case. Uh, you can see that recent technologies actually allows the system operator to send an instruction and expect that that resource is going to actually follow fully that instruction. They do have now the capability to really shape and control where to operate. They cannot produce more than the natural capability, but they can actually deck. And this is one of the targets that we have implemented through the market, that it's not just the challenge, the problem that the renewable penetration can pose, but also they can be the solution to those problems. And one of those is to make sure that they can participate fully in the market. What, what do I mean by this? Uh, similar to any conventional generation, these renewable resources have the capability and the obligation to participate in the market. They can actually submit an economical bid for the whole range of operation. Basically, they are indicating at what price they want to produce at certain level. And the market using the bids as the mechanism to clear is going to determine where to optimally dispatch those resources. In that case, by participating economically into the market, they are actually providing the flexibility to operate those resources into the system. Just to give you a rough reference, for instance, if we have about 15,000 megawatts of generation of renewable resources on a given day, about 40% of that, that would be about 6,000, 7,000 megawatts, is fully participating in the market. That means they are coming with economical bids and they are willing to move based on the price. And that poses a lot of flexibility to the system, how you can match supply and demand, even on those conditions where they are very challenging to handle. And uh, the other complication that comes, and also part of the solution that they can pose, is the ramps. These renewable resources can move that fast that in some cases can pose a challenge to the conventional generation to move to the same pace. If you have a decline of solar or wind generation at any point on time, naturally the conventional generation has to offset that change. So if the solar can basically move in a vertical ramp, what type of technology conventional generation can follow that type of ramp? Uh, 
more recently, for instance, we have the integration of batteries. Batteries can really match that ramp capability and can provide a very nice and clean solution to that uh, stress times for the, for the ramp's needs. Uh, what is our main challenge from the operational point of view? Obviously, one is ramp. No matter what, we have this ramping naturally happening in the, in the system just by the production of the renewable generation. And the other challenge is obviously how nicely they can follow the load. You have a natural profile of the load that they have to match not just with conventional generation, but trying to maximize the production of renewable resources. And uh, the other challenge that is in the longer term uh, approach has to do with this shifting. We are moving from the conventional generation towards a more clean renewable based generation. And that has to do with many other environmental goals that California has set. You may have heard, for instance, that we have a goal of reaching 33% of production from clean resources by 2030. Now we have 50% of uh, production by 2050, I believe. And now there is a, a law that was passed that by certain year, we have to reach basically 100% of, re, uh, of renewable generation. And this is a very interesting dynamic because, I, as I indicated, many of these goals are not really from the electric system. They are more from this environmental mindset that is imposed by the state. And obviously, we as the operators have to, to find a way to make it happen. And uh, what does that mean from the operational point of view? And I don't need to talk about in the longer term, in the future, because the future has reached us, and we are dealing with this right now in the present time. Uh, this picture is the very famous picture that captures in a nutshell what the operational challenges are. The first one is that we have dominant production of renewable sources from solar. We have, at any point in time, about 11,000 megawatts of solar production. And that is just the utility, the utility connected solar. If you add 11,000 megawatts of generation plus 7,000 megawatts of behind the mirror solar, we are talking about of about 18 megawatts of solar production at any given point on time. Both are, in, are going to impact the operation of the system in slightly different ways. When you take the profile of the solar production, for instance, typically the solar is going to be just in the sun hours. That basically means from 8 in the morning to 5, 6 p.m. You reach the maximum generation around 1, 2 in the afternoon. Naturally, when you have to absorb all that clean energy, naturally you have to displace conventional generation that is more expensive, that is slower to, to ramp. And what you get after you deduct the generation from solar is what we call the net load. That is basically the load that has to be met with conventional resources. And that is where you move from this light, uh, from this light shape of the typical load to the depressed uh, valley that you have by the level of the penetration that you have from solar. Back in 2011, 2010, when we did the projections of how far this valley would go uh, as long as the solar penetration increased, we were making these projections. And based on what we currently observe, we were actually three, four years ahead of these estimates because we didn't estimated that great how fast the behind the mirror production is taking place. Uh, let me tell you, for instance, there is a recent law that was passed in California that for any new house that is built after 21, it has to come with a rooftop solar. And that is also going to push even further the penetration of the solar that is behind the mirror. And obviously that has an impact on the load that we have to meet with the conventional resources. So if you capture this, uh, this information in this plot, what you have is a uh, two-part operational challenge. The first one is that naturally, at the middle of the day, you have to ramp down to the, low, to the lowest point of your curve. Typically, your lowest point of the demand happened to be at 2, 3 in the morning when everybody went to sleep, no industry is running, and you have to basically shut down a, a bunch of resources. And then by 4 or 5 p.m., you have to start bringing resources to start sustaining the morning peak, and you leave those for the evening peak. Well, with the penetration of the solar, now this is a more complicated challenge. 
First, because all the production that you have from solar that is very cheap is going to displace conventional generation that is more expensive. And that gives you this very depressed valley just in the middle of the day. And it's the worst time to have that because that is the time when you need to start moving resources and position the resources in place for being able to meet your evening peak. So you have these two problems. The first one is the low value. At some point, for instance, you may have out of a system of 50,000 megawatts, a minimum load of about 5,000 megawatts. You can imagine the level of inertia that your system may have at this point of the day. But then the complicated part is that from that lowest point, you have to go into this steep ramp until reaching the peak of the evening. For any given day, we're talking about over 15,000 megawatts that you have to ramp in a period of less than three hours. The ramps that you can observe when you compound the natural increase of the load plus the natural ramp of losing the solar is about 100 and 150 megawatts per minute. We are talking about 15,000 megawatts in a range of less than three hours, typically maybe in the range of two hours. That is a lot of conventional generation that you have to move up in order to compensate that fast movement of the, of the solar. So this is really the main operational challenge that we have. How do we have to handle these conditions? Well, as I indicated, we have a market and we run the operation of the system through the market. What would be the expected signal from the market point of view when you have this deep penetration of the renewable resources? Negative prices. Negative prices mean you have just too much generation and the signal is for resources to come down. So having a negative price is becoming the, the typical factor at the middle of the day indicating resources that they have to go down because just there is too much generation in the system. One of the challenges obviously has to do with how fast, how closely we can project these conditions to happen. This trends that you have in this display is actually a real trend for a given month that happens to be somewhere in the, in the spring time. This is the profile of solar and wind at the same time for each of the days of the month. And you can see that barely you can find two days that look the same. This is just tells you how, how volatile, how unpredictable the generation of renewable resources can be. And this is the information that we have to make up in the market to be able to dispatch resources in that way. And obviously, this is where the forecasting becomes very interesting because now you have to be able to accommodate these fast changing conditions in the system to be able to position the resources properly. Uh, when you do the forecast, obviously the closer you are to the real time, the more certain you are going to, to have the forecast because you are relying more and more on what we call persistency. The farther you go away from the real time, you have to rely more on weather conditions and that is where these models of numerical models for meteorological conditions play a role. This just is a snapshot of a given day that we have, even in the summer, when you expect that solar should be a full-blown there are not many conditions weather-wise that could pose a challenge. But still, in the middle of July, in the middle of the summer, you have one day in which you have each of the lines representing different time frames. For instance, the one that is at the top, the blue line, is the schedule or the projected forecast from the day ahead. When we run the day ahead, one day in advance, that was the best forecast that we have for that given day for solar production. When you start coming into the real time, that is the 15-minute market first that runs about 37 minutes in advance, you have the line in red. And then when you go into the five-minute operation of the system that runs seven and a half minutes in advance, you have the, the line in green. And then when you compare that against the actual, you can see how much actually they produce. And again, this is in the middle of the summer when you expect to have clean days with no clouds cover. If you are from the control room operating the system, this is the worst case you can have because you are projecting from the day ahead how much generation you have to position for the next day. As you start coming to the real time, you start seeing that you are missing generation and now you may be too late to commit generation to have these conditions absorbed. This is how the whole thing plays out and obviously raises the questions as to the weather is going to be what it is. We cannot deal with that. That is the reality of the, of the conditions. 
The problem is how can we hedge against this type of conditions? This is a comparison from day to day. It's just basically a week. And you can see how different is from day to day the net load that the system has to absorb. And you can see the range is not just in the magnitude, but also in the shape. And the shape that you see here is not the very smooth, nice load shape that you are thinking about in the textbook. This is the real life load that now the system has to deal with because all this variation has to do with how the renewable resources is being produced. Things are expected to even become more problematic in the sense of the volume that we have. Right now, we, as I indicated, we have about 7,500 megawatts of behind the meter. The complication with behind the meter is that it is generation that we have no visibility. We as the operator, the ones that do the forecasting that operate the system and balance supply and demand, don't know for certainty how much generation is behind the mirror, precisely because it's behind the mirror. So if you don't have the visibility for 7,000 megawatts of your system, that can pose a big challenge. And it's not that we don't have any visibility into the system, it's that we don't know exactly, explicitly, what the generation is associated with that behind the mirror. The only thing that we see is the net effect on the load, because the more generation you have behind the mirror, the less demand you have to meet. That is the effect that we only see. These are two dates, just a comparison from the winter to the summer. And you can obviously see that the conditions depend on the season, the type of the day, and the shape of the load is quite different depending on the season that you are dealing with. The main challenge with behind the mirror that has to do with how good our forecast is going to be has to do precisely with that visibility. As I indicated, there is some logics in, in the California system in which behind the mirror has this logic where there is net metering. You can produce, you can absorb. What we see is just the net balance between your generation and your demand. And that naturally raises the questions of how can we do a good forecast when we don't know exactly, explicitly, one of the main variables that play a role in the forecast that is the behind the mirror. This is why we have evolved the market in a more sophisticated fashion. As I indicated, the weather conditions are going to be what they are. We cannot do anything about that. However, we can find mechanisms through the market to be able to hedge against that uncertainty. We know temperature is going to be different from one day in advance to the next day. Just to give you a reference of how complicated this can be, for instance, if you see in the map California, the main load of California is basically in the coast. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Sacramento, all that area is along the coast. That basically means that when the sun comes and go, all the demand moves at the same time. You have all the demand basically moving and going on and off at the same time. In a typical given day, you may have a temperature error of more than 10 degrees, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That is just the natural error that the geographical condition of California is going to give you. You can imagine what a 10% and 10 degree forecast error is going to give you to the forecast. It's going to give you a very big uh, error in the, for, in the forecast as well. In any given day, this 10 degree forecast error can represent about 4,000 megawatts of uh, inaccuracy in the forecast. We know that weather condition is going to be always there. What we have worked since 2016 is in a mechanism that recognizes that uncertainty. We know the temperature is going to be off. How can we handle that? What we have estimated is basically what is the level of uncertainty that we have in our system. You know your best projection of the load forecast. Well, on top of that, what is historically the ranges of the uncertainty that you have to deal with? What you see here is no more than the statistical observations of the uncertainty that we have to handle in the system. You have the upper uh, values, the lower values, and you can see that those ranges from minus 4,000 to plus 6,000 megawatts. That is how big the error going from the day ahead to the real time is. That is how much we actually have to hedge the system to make sure that we can position the resources properly for the operation of the real time. 
The dots in, in the middle that are red lines basically are just the average points. So if we are able to quantify this uncertainty, the natural question is how can we able now to, to position the system to handle this level of uncertainty? Well, we develop a market mechanism. We develop a new market product. And that market product is called flexible ramp. We recognize that the uncertainty happens. Now we have to make sure that we have this capacity spinning and ready to be deployed when this uncertainty materializes. And the concept is very simple. You know that any time you are running the market, there will be uncertainty that can materialize as soon as the next five minutes. Well, this product, all what it does is basically create a slack, a headroom in the units to make sure that in, in addition to be able to meet your demand, you have this slack capacity, rampable and flexible, to be able to absorb any uncertainty that materializes in the five minute market, in the 15 minute market, in the hourly market. And this is the way how we are addressing these renewable integration uh, challenges. Because the uncertainty is going to be there, the variability is going to be there, the unpredictability is going to be there. It's a matter of what is the mechanism that you can have to absorb that uncertainty. And this has to do with the philosophy of how you run your system, because again, we believe in the philosophy of a market. And if you are going to use the attributes of certain resources, the price signal, the market signal has to be, you have to pay for those services. And that is the reason we have this product explicitly developed to, to pay for the services that they can provide. In this way, there will be a price signal that tells the resources what attributes are worth most. Well, this is all what I have. Thank you. <laughs>